Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Musel, for the for the big invitation and also allowing me to do this from the confines of my Brentwood office and not drive up to East Tennessee, which I do quite often. So anytime I could escape from that drive, uh, I appreciate it. Um, I'm a little nervous for this uh, talk because last time, or not the very last time, but a few times ago that I talked about cannabis, it was on Legislative Plaza. And I was before the House Health Subcommittee um, and I, I was uh, uh, severely heckled um, by the audience. Um, the very conservative Republican legislators were wanting to um, uh, promote um, medical marijuana, which I did not think was a good idea. So I was asked to testify by the chair of that health, health subcommittee and uh, you know, just was going to tell what what the facts are, as I hope to do here. But I was not ready for the, for the hecklers that so were very pro marijuana. Um, so um, I'm a little bit gun shy, you could say. Might even have some uh, post traumatic stress symptoms as a result. I know I'm speaking to a group of psychiatrists, which I appreciate. I feel like I'm home. Uh, but we are going to talk today about the current state of cannabis and really using evidence-based medicine, something which legislators, which policymakers, which industry do not really look at. They, they, they look at who's lobbying, how much money's behind it. You now, if you ever want to know an answer with politics, follow the money, as I've always said. So I have to do some things up front. Uh, disclosure, um, neither I nor any members of my immediate family have a financial interest or arrangement or affiliation that could be perceived as real or apparent conflict of interest related to the content or supporters of this activity. I nor my family is involved in the cannabis industry. I'm not an investor, I'm not a grower, I'm not a planner, I'm not even a user. Uh, I can't say that uh, to be true in high school, but um, not since high school. Um, I will say that this lecture represents medical facts, evidence-based medicine, and the views and my views. This lecture does not represent the views of the Tennessee Medical Foundation or regulatory medicine. These are just basically someone that did their homework giving a lecture. Um, uh, from an, another disclosure point of view, um, I, I will not discuss off-label investigational medication. Um, and I have not received any financial support for this lecture. My full-time job is the medical director of the Tennessee Medical Foundation Physicians Health Program. That's who pays the bills. I'm the president-elect of the National Federation, which is a, a, a time-consuming job. And I do some work for SUMIC. Uh, and I'm the volunteer medical director for two drug courts here in Middle Tennessee, the Nashville Davis County Drug Court or DC4, and then the Women's Residential Recovery Court. I'm a clinical assistant professor at Vanderbilt and help teach the overprescribing controlled drugs course there as well. Um, so we're gonna talk about cannabis, the plant and the cannabis industry to a degree, but not so much the politics of it. I wanna stay away from um, emotions here and just talk about the science behind uh, this, this plant. We'll learn about um, cannabis use and development of how it could promote uh, mood anxiety and especially psychotic disorders, and then look at some of the benefits and kind of what this is all uh, about. Um, so kind of on with the show, if you will. So what is cannabis? Well, marijuana is a plant. By definition, it is a plant and the risks are considerable. It's not a medicine by definition, but it does have some medicinal value. So what can we do? We could get educated, we could get involved, we could speak to your legislators, you know, you could lobby if you so choose one way or the other, whatever, uh, wherever you um, think the science is, you could get involved. And more importantly, as physicians, you need to educate your patients to the evidence and, and the science. So let's look at where we are for a second. 
marijuana is now legal in like 38 states. Legal by, it's, it's approved for recreational use, over 21. Uh, this began in 2012, uh, both, and this is in order of approval. So Colorado and Washington state were the first states that approved recreational marijuana for over age 21 in 2012. Uh, on this um, um, map of the United States, the, the, the blue states are the legal states. The green states are uh, legal for medicinal use only. And then where there's a D, it's uh, been decriminalized. Um, and obviously the gray states are where it's still, um, it's not approved for um, medical or recreational use. Um, Excuse me, Dr. Barron? Yes. I hate to interrupt you. Um, there is another window that is partially over your slide that we can see. Oh, is that better? Yes, sir. Sorry, I didn't inform you sooner. Uh, so uh, that's fine. Um, okay, um, this, this works better. So um, you can you can see now things. Okay, very good. I appreciate that. Um, so um, it, it, in order, it's um, you know well we we covered this slide. So on to the next slide. So um, the the genus species is cannabis sativa or cannabis s. There's also other plants like cannabis indica. And it used to be that cannabis sativa was, you know, the, the main plant that was um, used to, to get high. It was smoked. It was, uh, you know, uh, placed into brownies, um, gummies. But industry has kind of changed the genetics. It's not uh, genetically modified or GMO'd, but it's been bred in different ways. Um, cannabis indica used to be uh, the mainly for production of hemp and hemp products. Um, cannabis sativa had higher quantities of THC. Cannabis indica had higher quantities of CBD. But that kind of changed with the industry and the plant growing industry. So now they have these other strains, or as they call them, hemovars, which is type 1, 2, and 3. And type 1 is mainly grown for THC quantity. Type two is a kind of a combined approach, if you will, with the balance of uh, higher THC, uh, but also CBD or cannabinoids. And then type three is grown for the cannabinoids, the, the primary one being cannabidiol, which we'll look at in a minute. So um, it, th this is not the pot or the weed or the, you know, skank, whatever you called it when you went to high school or even college 30, 40 years ago, if you're my generation. Uh, the marijuana nowadays is much, much stronger. I'm using two monitors and I appreciate it because my head's all over the place. Uh, the, the cannabis sativa in general has about 480 unique compounds. 66 are the cannabinoids. So when someone smokes grass, smokes weed, they are getting a slew of chemicals. Not only that, but I'll explain also, they're also getting impurities because it's a phyto extractor. It actually cleans the soil. So what are some of the, uh, of the chemicals in um, cannabis sativa? Well, THC is the main psychoactive compound. And there's THC or delta-9, delta-8, delta-10. We'll look at that in a second. There's a tetrahydrocannabolic acid A, which is a little bit different. And then the cannabinoids. And there's um, CBD is cannabidiol, just one of the many cannabinoids. And as you can see from the slide, there's, there's numerous ones. And each cannabidiol has its own individual and interactive effects. So some cannabis, um, cannabinoids may be helpful, may have some anti-inflammatory properties, might have some anti-seizure properties, but others can actually be pro-inflammatory. And uh, THC is very psychoactive um, um, drug or um, chemical compound, I guess. Um, and it has its own properties and effects and is pro-psychotic even, which we'll see in a minute. Um, 
you cannot extrapolate individual compounds to the plant. The plant is just that the plant has 480 uh, other compounds, um, different compounds, many of which are um, bodily active or bind to the um, CB1 and CB2 receptors that are in our body. And again, the, the way that the plant has grown now, some is, is very strong or has high THC, like in the 25 to 30%. Some is just lower THC. It all depends on, on the chemobar or on the, um, on the um, variety of the plant. A little bit more about um, THC. Um, I heard that there was already a question, so I threw the, this slide in. Um, if you look at the, the um, Delta 9 THC, it's, it's labeled as to what, um, what um, number coincides with the carbon. So Delta 9, there's a double bond between 9 and 10 on the, on the ring. Well, Delta 8, that um, double bond swings over one, and it has less psychoactive properties. And then there's Delta 10, and I don't have room on the slide for it, but uh, the double bond goes between 10 and 10A on the, on the Delta 9 thing. So there's very little variation in the compound it's, itself, but that changes how it binds to the uh, cannabinoid receptors, uh, endocannabinoid receptors that we have in our body. Um, and kind of an analogy could be used to well, like heroin, codeine, and morphine. If you add a methyl group to morphine, you get codeine. And if you, you know, add acetyl groups to the morphine in the two spots, you get heroin. So very little changes make dramatic changes in how psychoactive a compound could be or how well it uh, performs agonist activity at the receptors. Um, as I said, um, the, the plant, whether it's cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, uh, doesn't matter what the chemovars are or, or the um, variations. It's a very, it's an excellent um, phyto extractor, or as they call it, phyto remediation of the soil. So what that means is that it extracts um, heavy metals, radionucleotides, explosive residues, uh, pesticides, herbicides uh, from the um, soil. So whatever is in, in that soil, whatever that plant is grown in, whatever type of pesticides are used or herbicides to prevent weeds, or uh, if there's some um, you know, uh, con contamination in the soil, it gets sucked up into the plant. And then when that plant is used to either smoke or to extract uh, other products, those, those heavy metals, those things go with the extraction process. So it's a very um, dirty plant, if you will, if it's not grown in just pristine, clean soils, which many times it's not, especially the, the older types where it was you know, illegal to grow and illegal, all that stuff. So what are some of the claims? Well, cannabidiol or CBD, they've made huge claims industry has made claims. Not all of it's backed up by evidence. You know, there, there is some where, um, um, evidence, um, good evidence that has some anti-epileptic properties. There's claims about anxiety, about pain, about dystonia, about anorexia, on and on and on. And uh, let's look at just really kind of what is approved so far by the FDA. Um, which is the next slide after this. So cannabis by itself is not an FDA approved drug. It is legal at some, at, at those state levels. At the federal level, it's still a schedule one on the DEA registration list. Um, and it has active ingredients, which are the cannabinoids. Um, and schedule one means it has a high abuse potential with no clear medicinal value. And I think, this is my own view, again, that doctors are placed in a really precarious and unfair position when medical marijuana is introduced into a state because it's generally regulated with a card or a prescription from a physician. So now yeah, you're putting physicians um, approving the use of marijuana 
the plant, not cannabinoid or you no know, individual substances or compounds from the plant. So it's it's really un, uh, unfair to the physician. What is approved by the FDA, the cannabinoid medications, and I can't pronounce some of them are epidiolex. And that is used for some other treatments of these kind of unusual types of seizure disorders in uh, patients two years old and older. Marinol has been around for a while now. It's a um, synthetic Delta-9 um, THC compound. It's not from the plant. It's not extracted from the plant. It's grown in the lab um, by itself. And it's been approved for a long time for um, you know, um, nausea associated with uh, cancer chemotherapy and the treatment of anorexia. It's pretty interesting though that there's a hyperemesis syndrome that's associated with um, Delta-9 THC. And then there's this other medicine, I'm not really, I have to look this up, uh, Casamet, another synthetically derived THC for nausea associated with um, cancer chemotherapy. And then in Europe, um, Sativex is approved, and it has equal parts THC and cannabidiol for um, mus um, um, mus um, muscular um, sclerosis related um, spasticity. Um, so, along the problems that marijuana, legal marijuana, has caused, um, in November 2000, Colorado voters passed medical marijuana. And then in November 2012, both Colorado and Washington state approved um, recreational use. So in the year 2011, before the recreational use got approved, drug-related expulsions at school had gone up 37%. Mar Marijuana-related emergency rooms uh, admissions uh, were uh, increased by about 10%. Motor vehicle fatalities involving marijuana increased 114%. This is before recreational. This is just medical marijuana. And 77% of motor vehicle accident fatalities had marijuana in their um, system. There is some real um, scathing, you could say, uh, information on these um, um, if you look up the legalization of marijuana in CARA, the impact studies, they are very against any type of medical or recreational marijuana. Um, this is just a copy of the one from 2016. The, the last one that I, I, I saw was from 2021. And um, it's, I don't know if you could say it's one-sided, but it's one viewpoint of how harmful marijuana has become in the state of Colorado. So uh, I'm not going to go into it because it, it is pretty um, um, singularly um, viewpointed. So we have cannabinoids that bind to CB1 and CB2 receptors. CB1 receptors are primarily located on nerve cells in the brain, spinal cord. They're also found in the spleen, on white blood cells, endocrine glands, um, and reproductive plans um, and the GI and G tracts. CB2 are mainly in the central nervous system in the hippocampus region, memory, and the peripheral immune system. And they do play a role in the inflammation process. So you can see kind of where cannabinoids will bind and kind of what harm or good they could do based on where these receptors are. Um, marijuana has become significantly more potent. This is not the weed of the, of the, of the, of the sixties, of the seventies, as you can see from, on this graph, you know, from 1960, uh, through the eighties, through, um, 2011, the THC psychoactive substance has increased dramatically from about 2% up to 12%. And lately, in the in the you know in the in the 2020s, it's up to like 15 to 20, 25 percent even. Plus, there's this um, extractor stuff where you get very high concentrations of of THC, uh, like 17 to 28 percent in the cannabis plant, 
but THC can also be extracted and put into concentrates such as earwax, a horrible name for something, um, shatter, um, uh, things like that that are up in the 80, 90% uh, concentrated rate. And as we know, when things get higher um, concentrated or more, um, more uh, potent, the risk increases dramatically, just as this illustration goes from heroin down to carfentanil, as far as um, lethal amounts. So high potency, um, and, and no, this is true with, with, with the opiates, which I'm much more familiar with, no, the MMEs have increased dramatically since 2000, um, um, since the, um, 1990 on up through uh, 2012, and that started to decrease. Um, but in 2021, as a result, well, we still had a huge amount of overdose deaths, not related to misprescribing per se, but related to the lethal amounts of a very high potency fentanyl and fentanyl analogs on the street. Um, in this one um, study, daily cannabis use was associated with an increased odds of psychotic disorders compared with never um, um, increasing uh, to the nearly five times increased odds for daily use over um, uh, with high potency types of cannabis. So um, um, very um, significant risk of um, high potency leading to psychosis or psychotic behaviors. Um, the way that this study uh, was set up, there was some um, bias I thought as far as true and true, but causality may be a little bit um, weak. But um, uh, in Denmark, those that uh, use high potency um, um, marijuana products uh, had a four times increased risk of developing schizophrenia if they were you know, had that diagnosis of cannabis use disorder. Um, daily and near daily use has uh, dramatically increased with the you know, recreational or with making marijuana legal, if you will. The um, red line is how many daily users there are and the yellow is monthly users. And you can see that in the last you know, 20 years, from uh, 1992 up to 2018, the, the, there's been significant increase in use. Um, and um, marijuana use is increasing in the ages of between 19 and 30 as well. Um, so 43% reported use in the past year, 29% in the past month, and 11% are, uh, are now daily users in um, um, 2021, up to 2021. The um, um, Drug Abuse Warning Network also shows that marijuana now is the um, um, second most um, 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 drug that's related to emergency room visits. Methamphetamine is number one, then comes marijuana, and then alcohol. Alcohol is still the number one reason people are admitted to treatment centers, but marijuana is number two not opioids, which is very interesting to me. Another increase in utilization is emergency room visits in the light green and then hospitalizations in the, in the whatever color that is, uh, turquoise, I guess. But you can see that they have dramatically increased from uh, 2000 up to 2015. Yep, go over this one. So are there risks or benefits in obtaining a medical marijuana card? Well, from this JAMA 2022 article, in this randomized clinical trial of 186 participants, immediate acquisition of a medical marijuana card increased the incidence and severity of cannabis use disorder and resulted in no significant improvements in pain, anxiety, or depressive symptoms. But there was um, some um, improved by self-report sleep quality. So is it, is it a benefit? Is it a risk? You have to answer that for yourself. 
Um, exposure to, to, and this is kind of epigenetic stuff, which is well beyond my understanding of how this works, but um, uh, not with this study, sorry, but with the next few slides. Um, so exposure to, to THC, Delta-9 THC specifically, around birth or adolescence demonstrated impaired learning and memory in later life. Remember that the hippocampus is a, a high um, cannabinoid receptor site. Um, and this was in the um, rodent brain, of course. Um, in, the, in this study dealing with epigenetics, the, the preconception cannabis extract exposure associated with detectable changes in the offspring of the DNA that are functionally related to gene expression and, and cardiomegaly. So these results really support the results that paternal preconception exposure, so the father you know, using marijuana uh, to can influence offspring's outcome, which is, um, you know, uh, again, I don't understand the epigenetic work at all, but um, it it's, uh, has some serious implications, clearly. Um, there was an average decline of two IQ points following exposure to cannabis youth, um, cannabis youth use in youths, hard to say for me. Uh, and there is an association of cannabis use and the risk of developing depression and suicidality in young adults. Again, very well done. This is a meta-analysis, large N number. There was no uh, association with cannabis use and anxiety, but was with developing depression and suicidality. Um, and you can see in this uh, 2012 study that the number of teens, um, uh, um, teen suicides had increased, even though they were still under the age of 21. So um, again, even though they weren't supposed to be able to get maricyclic alcohol, you know, uh, people under 21 can get alcohol if they want to. Uh, a very clear, you know, slope uh, relationship between marijuana and number of suicides in Colorado. Now the numbers just increase, the slope is pretty significantly upwards. Um, in this um, um, study, the, 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 this showed the evidence of the impact on prenatal cannabis exposure on psychopathology. Um, and that does not end when children enter adolescence. So this gives further caution against cannabis use during pregnancy. Evidence that the impact of prenatal cannabis exposure on psychopathology does not ameliorate as children enter adolescence further cautions against cannabis use during pregnancy. Um, and I already spoke about this, uh, but I will talk about more. There is now, especially with the stronger THC products, this hyperemesis syndrome, which is actually fairly common. Um, and it's, you know, after using uh, high potency marijuana, intense and persistent episodes of nausea, vomiting, dehydration, and abdominal pain, kind of a hyperemesis syndrome. Even though um, marijuana or rather cannabinoid or THC is approved for nausea in uh, chemotherapy. So, you no, know, that's a lower strength than the dorabinol and the higher, higher potency. It has just the opposite, it actually promotes emesis. And the only treatment is really to not to use. Um, it's interesting though that those that have this hyperemesis syndrome have figured out if they take a hot shower, that will relieve the nausea or vomiting. Um, up to 6% of emergency room visits are for recurrent vomiting or hyperemesis. Um, interesting. And then is there a withdrawal or not from cannabis? Well, there is. Cessation of heavy use, um, which is daily or almost um, daily over a few months, uh, can result in irritability, anger, aggression, nervousness, anxiety, sleep difficulty, um, loss of appetite, uh, depressed mood, restlessness. So there is a significant uh, clinical 
syndrome associated with cannabis withdrawal. Um, the use of cannabis has been associated with poor treatment outcomes. One that's related to um, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorders, or major depressive disorders. And kind of like the really severe stuff I'm really getting to, um, in this one study, 32% uh, of patients with a substance-induced psychosis converted either to bipolar or schizophrenia spectrum disorders. The highest conversion rate was found for cannabis-induced psychosis with 47% converting to either schizophrenia or bipolar. So when someone's admitted you know, to the psychiatric you know, emergency room or inpatient, you know, if they're a cannabis user um, and it's just like you know, substance-induced psychosis, they will convert 47% of the time to um, develop a bipolar type one or schizophrenia um, spectrum disorders. So there's a lot of this. And actually there's a physician right now at Vanderbilt Psychiatric Hospital who was in our program uh, quite a few years ago. He finished his five years of monitoring. He did well. Uh, he started using high potency marijuana and became psychotic. Um, and he went to work, unfortunately, impaired with psychosis. Now, he didn't smell of alcohol. Um, they uh, did not do a urine drug screen at work. They just knew that he became psychotic. They called mobile crisis, mobile crisis, evaluated him. He went to the hospital, urine drug screen showed uh, THC, and he admitted to, to you know, smoking marijuana. Um, he uh, obtained it illegally, of course. He lives in our state, Tennessee, but he became psychotic. That's the first physician I'm aware of that developed a um, psychosis due to cannabis use. Um, Marijuana legalization opioid deaths. These results that legal medical marijuana, particularly when available through retail dispensaries is associated with a higher opioid mortality. So it doesn't treat opioid use disorder, it actually makes it more um, lethal. Um, and there is considerable evidence that cannabinoids have a potential for harm in vulnerable populations such as adolescents and those with, again, psychotic disorders. Um, cannabinoids have a potential for harm in vulnerable populations such as adolescents. The, the current evidence base is insufficient to support the prescription of cannabinoids for the treatment of psychiatric disorders. This is from our own journal, American Journal of um, Psychiatry. Um, similarly, there appears to be a negative mental health outcomes and addiction with higher potency. Um, again, in conclusion, these findings were from the systemic review highlight the potential for an increased risk of negative mental health outcomes and addiction with higher potency cannabis use. The, 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 the findings support recommendation to discourage the use of higher potency cannabis products for low risk use. Um, and it's interesting, I kind of put this in because there's a big comparison in my mind uh, that big pharma industry is behind the, the medical marijuana and then the legalization. Medical marijuana is just a stepping stone for legalization of marijuana. Um, both opioids and cannabis were had popular and very unsubstantiated claims of benefit with the minimization of harm, minimization of uh, addiction. Um, they were driven by strong financial motives and even the legislators you now are looking at the tax dollars that could be generated. But um, if you go back and read those um, um, uh, pamphlets out of Colorado, the costs of marijuana with emergency, with medical care, uh, um, suicides, loss of productivity, greatly outweigh the tax benefits, apparently. Uh, physicians' responsibility is to do no harm, obviously. So um, let's clear the smoke for a minute. More research is needed, absolutely. And it was hard to do 
uh, research with marijuana because it was a schedule, it is a schedule one drug. So you really have to get, you no, know, you can't just do low level, you have to get IRB approval, you have to get the weed, it has to be grown in state. So you need to connect with um, UT, uh, Department of Agriculture to get appropriate weed for your, it's, it's a, there's numerous hurdles to do any type of research because of its um, schedule one um, um, by the DEA. Um, if it is no medical marijuana, then we need to be, physicians need to be driving the discussion of risk and benefit safety. Um, medicalizing a recreational substance and marijuana is a plant, it's not a medicine. It has some medicinal value, some of the, of the components have medicinal value. Um, need to speed up here, sorry. Um, and there needs to be warnings about don't use if you have a, uh, you know, a genetic predisposition to a psychotic disorder, or if you have a psychotic disorder, don't use if you're a child, young adult, adolescent, and don't use if you're pregnant or want to get pregnant because of the epigenetic components of these. I'm going to skip this. So um, I, I was asked um, fairly recently about well, Virginia has legalized marijuana and you guys are right next to Virginia. What do you do with someone that's on controlled substances that you're monitoring for, like opioids for chronic pain or um, even stimulants, and they show up with the urine drug screen that's positive for THC? Well, um, it's a great question and uh, there's a lot of answers to it. But what my recommendations are is that if they need have a condition that warrants a, um, a scheduled medication that um, is a um, responsibility, then there's a responsibility not to use other mood altering or addictive medications that could interfere with the outcomes of, of, of that medication. I mean, if they're on an opioid, the risk of using marijuana increases the risk of that opioid as we've seen. So the answer is you could either smoke marijuana or I could prescribe you an opioid. You cannot do both. In the physician population, um, it's really a lot easier argument because physicians are safety, are part of a safety sense of occupation. Um, so we do not permit marijuana in physicians. And now a lot of the medical schools are drug screening their incoming med students and interns and, and residents. And if they're positive for THC, they get referred to us. And I'm always here, well, I'm taking um, CBD, which is fine, but CBD, especially some of the right, is not pure CBD. There's always, not always, but there can be THC products in that. Um, so my always say, well, then, it's your responsibility to use a CBD product that does not contain THC, which is a psychoactive product. Um, marijuana, or rather THC is not because it's so lipophilic, it hangs around the, the glial cells, the myelin sheath, uh, the brain for, for months and months and months and months after just even single use. It can be detected in urine for up to 30 days from single use. And if someone's kind of heavy set, obese, has a lot of adipose, it could be uh, for someone that's uh, more of a heavy user and then they stop, it could be um, um, seen in the urine drug screens for months on end afterwards. And then you need to get qualitative measures to make sure that it's a decreasing amount. It's not well stored in keratin or, 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 or hair. So using hair testing for marijuana isn't very helpful. Um, and again, in, in states where you know you can get a medical card or it's, or it's recreational, it's still not advisable for safety sense of occupations like physicians, like airline pilots. We have about five minutes left. I do want to talk about the physician health program uh, very quickly, and then I'll open up to any questions that um, you may have. Um, the um, Tennessee Medical Foundation is our states uh, physician health program. 48 states have a physician health program. Ours got its um, uh, beginning off the um, Tennessee Medical Association as the Impaired Physician Committee. It has since uh, 92 
uh, became a um, 501c3 independent um, non-for-profit organization. So we are completely separate from the Tennessee Medical Association, completely separate from the licensing board, from the Board of Medical Examiners or Board of Osteopathic Examination. Uh, we've had three medical directors. David Dodd, a general surgeon, was one. Roland Gray, a pediatrician, was two, and then me. Um, about half of what we do is related to substance use disorders. And the other half is for other types of psychiatric disorders, including physician burnout syndrome, which is you know, over 50% over of physicians have at least one symptom of burnout, um, especially with the parallel pandemic. Um, we've helped over 2,900 physicians in the last 20 years, which is a huge number. We generally, well, right now we have about 228 physicians that are being monitored. Um, we have two tracks. We have a confidential track, meaning that the physician either self-refers or more likely they're referred by their spouse, the chief wellness officer, the uh, chief of staff, the um, chair of the department. Um, and it's a confidential referral. We will you now speak with the, whoever referred, we'll speak with the physician, we'll get the information, I'll meet with the person uh, from, if they're in East Tennessee, I'll meet with them by Zoom, and then we'll figure out what's needed, whether a outside evaluation or treatment or um, follow up with a, a um, individual um, psychotherapist or psychiatrist or something like that. We now have a safe haven clause on the renewal application for your licensure, which is wonderful. It basically says if you have an alcohol use or drug use disorder and are a uh, compliant participant with the Tennessee Medical Foundation, you may answer no to this question, uh, which helps with uh, reducing the stigma of getting help. We also have a mandated track where it's basically the same process on our end, but rather than be self-referred or referred in a confidential manner, the physician is referred by the um, licensing board. So it's usually for those docs that get like a driving under influence conviction, all convictions have to be reported within 30 days. So the board finds out about it and, um, you know, you get moved over um, to us. We generally will need to send compliance letters back to the board, um, things like that. We've also developed a wellness tool. And uh, when I say physician health program, this is open to all licensees and all trainees, residents, with or without their own individual license and medical students. So it's open to anyone that has a license or will be you know, in uh, preparation for a license. And we've also developed a wellness tool called the TNPSQ. And actually today is the three year anniversary of its launch. Um, and I'm very proud of this. We're the first physician health program to develop this, this wellness product for all licensees across state. Again, open to all physicians, med students, residents uh, with or without licenses. And this is a wellness tool. It's a uh, online screening tool with backside psychiatric help. Um, so it's free, it's anonymous, it's confidential, it's driven by you, the user. So the person, physician, whoever logs onto the website, which I'll share in a minute, uh, they you know give a, a username, uh, use a password, whatever they want to use. They don't have to use their own email address. Um, they then take a 39 question questionnaire, which includes the PHQ-9, and it includes um, anxiety, depression, um, trauma, substance use disorder questions. It's computer scored, you put it into one of three tiers, tiers one, two, three. And the um, um, uh, um, once it is computer scored, you then uh, can dialogue with a psychiatrist that gets the result of your, of your screening tier one, two, three, and they will guide you as to what is needed. You have to either dialogue, um, dialogue with them through the website, or you can, uh, if you do give your email address, you're not required to by means, but if you do, they, will, they can um, dialogue with you just through your, um, through your email. And they can choose, or you could choose that they can treat you as well. We are not, that's completely anonymous and confidential to us. We have no idea who's using this, but we know it's being used. It's free. 
as well. I have mentioned that. Um, this um, tool was developed initially by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. It's called their ISP or Interactive Screening Platform. Uh, we rebranded it with their permission and their license as the TNPSQ is written up by the AFSP and the Lorna Bring Heroes Foundation. Um, our utilization, this is through January, so about a week ago, we've had 631 users. Uh, we launched this February 3rd, and we thought that was right before the pandemic happened. We thought, well, we can't advertise it, no one's going to eat and then know about it, no one's going to use it. Um, AFSP said we'd have about 75 users per year before the pandemic happened because uh, they extrapolate out from like UC San Diego or other hospital chains or hospitals that have used this tool. And we were blown away as was AFSP by the utilization. So we've had 631 individual screen. And really the most important part is this lower number, five or 83% were not receiving therapy or help elsewhere. So that we're reaching the audience that is you know, either stigmatized to get help or ashamed to get help or think it's a sign of weakness to get help, things like that. This is the link directly to the um, TNPSQ. There are links on the, on the Tennessee Medical Association website, on our website, on the um, SVMIC websites. Some hospital chains have it on their website. Um, and this is how to reach me. Um, if needed, I answer emails and um, phone calls pretty regularly. Thank you very much.